in typical tag style, I'm trying out some some new idea. Well, newish actually. I've been banging on about this for a while, but haven't quite got my act together to um, um, to get these kind of ideas any further. So, if you have any um, thoughts on this uh, subject, I'd really appreciate everyone's opinions. Um, I'm going to be looking at. Um, plastered skulls from the Neolithic of the Levant and a bit of Anatolia, um, which are usually interpreted as being related to um, evidence of status and hierarchy or ritual elites or evidence of social cohesion. And I'm wondering whether we're missing something far more basic and human in their interpretation and whether we can think about concepts of grief and, and mourning and bereavement in the past. Um, I've come to this from a particular angle. I've um, I recently got funding from the AHRC for our Continuing Bonds project, which some of you might have heard us talking about on Monday. Um, and this is a project which works with um, archaeology and palliative care. And we're very much looking at how the um, past can inform the, the present. Um, so um, the project is continue, Continuing Bonds. Um, how can I press that arrow? Um, that's our team. It's an interdisciplinary team of um, myself and Lindsay, who are the archaeologists on the team, uh, Laura Middleton Green and Christina Fall, who are in palliative medicine, and Jenny Days, who is a psychologist. So we're a very uh, interdisciplinary bunch. Um, and what we're doing is looking at whether case studies from the past can help. Um, facilitate people's conversations um, and cultural understandings of death and dying in, in the present. Um, we know that um, we're particularly working with healthcare professionals and we, um, we know from the World Health Organization, the NHS, suggests that as more and more people uh, um, know about their death before it happens with the advancement of um, um, medical practice. Um, there's still this huge taboo around death and dying, around people talking about it. Um, and one of the things that can help facilitate a, a better death is an openness about death and dying. Is an acceptance of death as a natural part of life rather than seeing it as some kind of failure of medical, medical, um, medical science. Um, so what this project does is seeks. Um, to look at whether archaeology can provide a role in um, kind of facilitating conversations around death and dying, which may sound bizarre at first, but, you know, we, we deal with some really fascinating stuff in archaeology. Um, and for lots of people, it's a safe way in. If we're talking about the ancient pyramids or the, the plastered skulls here, they are um, they're far removed from our own personal experiences which usually means that people can talk about them with fascination. Um, but however, in our pilot studies, which... Oh, no, I haven't got a slide on, sorry. Um, we discovered that... Um, we did some work with Sarah Tarlow in Leicester, and we had um, exhibition boards around um, public spaces which had archaeological and ethnographical material on. Um, and... We kind of went there and kind of sociable drinking hours and started chatting to people. And what we found is that people would start talking about the plastered skulls. And then before very long, they'd um, start talking about what had happened to their great auntie. And then before very much longer, they'd start talking about their own expectations, their own fears, their own wishes, in a way that if you'd gone up to someone ordinarily on a Friday night in a pub and said, hey, you want to talk about death? you'd have got a whole other reaction. So what our project is seeking to do is provide an evidence base for this. We're trying to formalise this and see if this kind of anecdotal pilot work has actually got any grounds. So we're running um, workshops with healthcare professionals, showing them um, on these four themes, images of the dead, ancestors, age and circumstance of death, and memorialisation and legacy. And we're looking... Um, uh, whether this has any impact on their understandings of death but also on their professional practice. So we're going to follow up with them a few months later and see what happens. Um, we've, um, these are the sorts of uh, materials that we show them during the workshops. These have been prepared by Lindsay Booster, uh, one of our postdocs on the project. 
and we get them to think about um, what they find challenging, how the material makes them feel, <coughs> and we prompt discussions uh, around the materials. Um, so this is still very much work in progress, but really what I'm getting at today is um, that project is all about how the past is informing the present. Um, this paper today is actually thinking about how that then re informs our understanding of the past. So in working with the palliative care professionals, I've um, come across kind of various perspe perspectives on theories of bereavement. Um, there's an idea that we're moving away from notions of detachment theory, the idea that you get over someone's death, to um, theories of continuing bonds or the dual process mod model, which argues that the dead actually continue to have a presence amongst the living, that once someone dies, that's not necessarily the end of their place in your life. They just move to a different place in your life and you continue with those bonds with the dead just in a, in a different way. Um, which is something I found um, really fascinating. And it's got me wondering whether this might be... Whether in... Um, you know, we know as archaeologists we try to understand our, our mortuary evidence. Yeah, it, and, you know, Sarah Tyler, who has written about the archaeology of the emotion, um, as does Oliver Harris and Tim Floor Sorensen, and... Um, yet we see a reluctance to really embrace the idea of emotion in, in the past. And I'm wondering whether just we're missing something really basic here. So I'm just going to quickly run through some of the evidence I'm talking about, which is based um, um, around sites in the Levant and some of Anatolia, sort of here. Um, and... Um, dating to around... Um, 9,000 to 8,000 BC, um, with a reoccurrence in Anatolia um, a couple of thousand years later. Um, now, there's a whole variety of different ways of treating the dead at the time. One of the treatments is to bury someone beneath the floor of a house, um, plaster over the floor, carry on living there, um, <coughs> and then sometime um, after the death, although probably not so long after the death, you'd return to a grave and... Um, you probably don't need to be an um, anatomist to spot what's missing um, in the picture in front of you. They would remove the skull or uh, mostly the cranium. And the um, cranium themselves would often be found reburied, often in, in groups or, or clusters. Some of them had undergone um, further treatment, such as uh, plastering. So what would happen is when the, the skull was dry, a uh, face would be recreated over the bone made out of mud lime or gypsum plasters um, to, to recreate a, a face. Um, sometimes they'd be further enhanced, such as using shells for the eyes. Um, often they would be painted, often in uh, browns and pinks. And you can see the one on the top right has got um, stripes across the head. Um, and uh, these are probably some of the most... Um, incredible examples from Tal Aswad um, in Syria where you can see they've um, gone to the trouble of um, depicting eyelashes with charcoal. Um, incredible preservation but always also incredible um, skill that's gone into creating these. Um, oh, I, a plug for the British Museum, they've just opened um, an exhibition on one of the Jer Jericho skulls run by Alexandra uh, Fletcher. Uh, it's open until February and it's well worth seeing. It's a free exhibition at the British Museum at the moment if you want to see one of the plaster skulls at the moment. Um, we have also found uh, these plastered faces. At first they were thought to be masks but actually it looks like they were um, have been plastered faces which have been removed um, from, from, the, from the face. Um, and as I've already mentioned, traditional interpretations of these seem to focus around the idea that these were ritual leaders, that these were obviously important people. We don't get so many of them. There's around 90 found in total, um, which, you know, is a, is a fair number, but it's by no means what was happening to everybody. So the kind of assumption is that these were obviously the elite in society. Or um, Ian Kite has argued that they were a way of masking inequalities by creating a communal focus for activities. Um, 
that's all very well and that might have been going on as well but I just wonder whether we're missing something really kind of basic in 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 the plastered skulls one thing that really strikes me when we look at the plastered role, the skulls is the role of um, display and performance. These were handled, these weren't just kind of kept pristine. They were evidence of um, being worn, of being repaired. Uh, the example on the right, um, the skull on the right has got its nose um, broken and mended. Um, we've got the um, skull on, on, on the left, had um, a base modelled um, so it would facilitate its upright display, as indeed were the ones on the right. Um, one of the later examples on, on the middle of preservation isn't that great, but these had um, beads inserted for eyes and were found displayed on, on benches around, around a building. Um, the incredible example from um, Chattel Hoyek, which is a bit later than the others, but here you've got um, um, the, um, there's just been one plastered skull found on the site and it's been found cradled in the arms of an, an adult female. And um, this had evidence of um, many layers of plastering. It had been used and reused a number of times. And this is a recurrent feature that they were uh, replastered um, through their use. So. I'm wondering if what's going on here is rather than this just being about some kind of way of looking at elites is actually whether this is some way of um, keeping the dead close, um, keeping them within the family, within the household. That was the other thing I haven't mentioned, that they're mostly found within household contexts, um, usually beneath the floor of houses or in courtyard areas. Um, occasionally they're found um, the tell us what ones are found starting mortuary areas but that's uh, a bit rarer but they just seem to be within the, the kind of household health, household context so this has got me thinking from working with uh, um, palliative care colleagues today and thinking about grief and mourning and bereavement whether there's just something going on here and actually whether the plastered skulls aren't showing some motivation to keep the dead longer. Is this the evidence of keeping the dead amongst us? Um, this is something that Melanie Giles and indeed um, Howard has also talked about this, about how preserved bodies in uh, museums, for instance, uh, pr um, provide a way for the living to engage with the dead. But they also, um, Melanie Giles has talked about the bog bodies as um, prolonging the deceased's presence amongst the living. Um, taking a snapshot of various places through time and space, so excuse, uh, excuse me for doing that. Um, the preserved heads um, from the Maoris uh, um, argue to be, again, about keeping the beloved closer to the living uh, for longer. Um, um, many of the um, ossuaries from Europe, um, Paul Pudinaris, <coughs> Apologies if I pronounced that wrong, has talked about the mediating relationships between the living and the dead. And this might not be so different to um, thinking about Victorian um, portraits of the dead, when often the only time you'd get a photograph taken would be when someone died, often, often children. So we've got these portraits of, of dead children. Um, they would also um, have hair mementos of the dead, create these... Um, ornaments or brooches from, from the hair of the dead. And this might not be so different, actually, to keeping um, the ashes of a loved one on the mantelpiece today, or now you can get cremation jewellery made, or you can have cremation tattoos made. I know this is something that Chris Fowler is also looking at. Um, and we've also got a recurrent theme here. Um, something myself and Mel gave a paper on recently is the role of technology in, in this. Um, uh, the use of technology in keeping the dead alive longer, whether at the time of the plastered skulls, uh, plastering was a relatively new technology. For the Victorian area, photography was a new technology. Now we've got these new technologies of making jewellery out, out of the dead and we're using that to keep the dead amongst us for living. Or even the digital, digital Facebook and the digital... Uh, route for memorialisation and remembering the dead. It's also um, struck me that often, thank you, it's, we see the memorialisation of the more sudden or unexpected or abrupt deaths. Um, and this is something I've seen in a few papers uh, throughout the TAG conference, something that 
uh, Claire Copper was talking about um, to you yesterday. Um, and so this has prompted me to actually have a look at some of the data um, on the plaster sculpture that's available. Uh, now, with all sorts of caveats, many of you will know much more about um, ageing of skulls than I do, so I don't profess to be an expert. And um, sadly, all of the studies have been carried out by different people using different methods, so this is still quite preliminary and isn't exact. But in my kind of um, broad brush looking at things, um, the adult category seems to contain both older and younger individuals um, according to who's categorised the skulls. Some will just have one category of adults, some will have older and younger adults. Um, but if we look at the number of um, juveniles and young adults, um, I'm now at um, the University of Bradford, so I thought I'd better put some graphs in my presentations because I'm in the Archaeological Sciences Department. <laughs> um, but we can see that um, rather than um, previous interpretations, which did, used to think that these belonged to um, elder male ancestors, that's now pretty much been debunked, but we've still got actually a fair number of them that were definitely younger, many of them which might have been younger in the adult category. Um, and although we can't see the cause of death, I'm wondering whether there's also something else going on that might relate to the age and circumstance of death that might be a motivation behind these plastering of skulls and the idea um, of keeping the dead closer for longer. Um, so, just to conclude, these are my um, kind of preliminary ideas. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Can we really use um, contemporary theories of grief and mourning to try and understand the Neolithic? Um, mostly, uh, I myself would have said no, but I'm beginning to wonder whether in certain places and certain times we shouldn't actually be thinking more obviously about um, emotional reactions to death and the ideas of keeping the dead amongst the living for longer. Thank you very much.